Good morning, Atlantis. Uh, good morning. The question is from David Hopkins from Wardsville, Missouri, uh, age 40, and he asked the question, I noticed that the Velcro attach points in the shuttle cabin are both blue and yellow. Any significance to the different colors? Well, Velcro, as you know, is a, a friend of astronauts. It's very easy to lose things up in space. We're on a camping trip, but since there's no gravity, uh, things tend to float away. And of course, we use Velcro to help keep things in place. The blue Velcro is permanent Velcro that is exists on all of the vehicles in standard locations, and they leave it on the orbiter from flight to flight. The yellow Velcro is crew option that we can put in locations that make things easier for us for our particular mission. Now, some crews uh, put more yellow Velcro around the vehicle, and, and then multiple crews like those locations. And so lately, I've noticed that the folks who process the vehicles have been leaving some of the yellow Velcro on because it's useful to multiple crews. Eventually, if it stays in one place long enough, then they change it to, to blue, and it becomes a standard location. The other interesting thing to note is that on the structure of the vehicle in the cabin, we always put the pile part of the Velcro, and then all of the objects, the movable objects that we move from place to place, like cameras and pens and pencils and pockets, we put the pile side of the Velcro so that everything is standard. We'll be using APU number one. Number one. Now receiving live television of the flight deck. Crew again preparing for the checkout of the flight control system. That's the uh, rudder speed brake and elevons that are used to steer the vehicle once it re-enters the atmosphere and begins to operate like an airplane. For this uh, particular checkout, one of the three APUs will be activated. This will be a APU or auxiliary power unit number one. Lannis, we're with you on the flight deck. Live television now coming down from Atlantis and the flight deck in this uh, image. Commander Jim Weatherby and pilot Mike Bloomfield in their seats. And directly behind them, mission specialist Scott Perzinski, the flight engineer on the STS-86 mission. Maybe he can do it on the next flight. Atlantis, we're standing by.
This is Mission Control Houston. The uh, images on NASA television uh, showing the three up, pul up, up pulse firings. On DTO 712. Go ahead, Wendy. The entry setup is complete and everything checks good. Great, thank you. Congratulations your way on an outstanding mission so far. Uh, we've been watching you uh, on the ground here throughout uh, your mission and uh, throughout ours down here. Well, thank you very much. It's, as you know more than anyone, it helps if you have a good crew, and I have one of the best, and these folks are really awesome, and they've been doing a great job for me. Uh, and so far, everything's worked well, and I guess uh, almost the rest of it is up to me, at least the last part of it. But, of course, I can't do that without their continued help and uh, support, so we'll see how it goes. Yes, indeed. Uh, Jim, uh, I have to ask one question. Having been involved in uh, training you folks in, in water transfer, I, uh, I should ask how that went. Well, we had a tough time remembering, and uh, we spilled all the water and didn't transfer any of it. <laughs> no, just kidding. It uh, was great training. You did a, a wonderful job. Uh, and it was even fun. We had a lot of fun uh, filling up the water bags, and we did it all just according to your plan and transferring. 
for, I think, more water than uh, we had intended the most so far, maybe even, and uh, the Russians were very happy with it. So we thank you, and I'm sure they thank you for all your great training. Well, I hope Dave's got enough to drink for the next few months. Uh, there's a few folks here that'd like to say hello to you, so let me pass you on uh, to Vicky, if I may. Okay, well, we know exactly who to pass on to talk to you uh, related to your past job, and uh, he's right here with us. Hi, Vicky, good evening. Yeah, they are teasing me, but I enjoyed your food. It's fantastic. <laughs> Beautiful, and I never had such a good food before, and uh, the, the only problem is that I'm getting more and more, and uh, I, am emptying, I am emptying all the containers, and I... Just afraid I'm taking weight. Well, I'm glad. We never had such good food either, but that's not because we aren't trying. John Luke keeps eating all of it. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, and uh, since I do have connections down at the Cape, I was wondering if uh, there's anything special that Mike would like to have waiting for him when he gets back. Oh, Vicky, that's a very kind thought. Thanks very much. But uh, my kind of. Um, dreams were way ahead of you and uh, I kind of set this up and I'm hoping that they'll have some lasagna and uh, pizza there for me, different <laughs> days, as well as a lot of chocolate <laughs> and beer. <laughs> well, I'll be sure they get that message and uh, now I'll pass you on to, uh, to Laura. Uh, yes, um, as part of this test, we're doing the exercise countermeasure protocol that will be used on station and I was just wondering if... Uh, Michael Full could comment on some of the exercise protocols they did on Mir. Um, Laura, um, I was going to ask you the same question, actually, um, for, your, for what you're doing. Um, we spent basically uh, two exercise periods a day. Um, some crew members do not uh, carry this out, by the way, I should say that, but uh, for plan, you, you do two per day, and uh, it's timeline for an hour, but it takes about an hour and a half to two hours for each one of them. And uh, basically you do uh, one session on a treadmill running, and the other is on an ergometer. And the ergometer is split between uh, cycling it with your legs and uh, moving the ergometer with your hands. As well as that, um, something which probably you guys don't need on Earth, but what you would do on a space flight, are the, uh, what we call the expanders. It's a Russian word for these big bungees. And they're very well designed with nice um, trimmings and things, so, so that you can uh, work out different muscles of your body just by... Uh, being anchored to the treadmill in your harness and then uh, stretching your arms and legs in different directions and standing up and doing squats. And uh, that system, I think, is very well worked out by the Russians and uh, they've had pretty, su I, I would say, great success with it overall in their program. And I did not deviate from their protocols at all. Um, and uh, I would re recommend, just to re relieve some of the boredom anyway, um, doing a, a pretty serious exercise program and twice a day is just fine where uh, you listen to music, you enjoy each other's music, um, and uh, try not to get in the way of, of your meal times. John Lewis, i got a question about um, the differing schedules that you have. Uh, you know, the shuttle base is more of a timeline type schedule. When you get in the longer durations, we've noticed in here through our 30 day, our 60 days, and now into our 90 day, uh, that it's kind of harder to timeline and it's almost easier to set the schedules yourself uh, on board the vehicle. And I was just wondering uh, how you all noticed that uh, uh, relative to the shuttle and to the mere experience. Uh, John, um, actually, we, we stuck pretty close to a timeline most days, but it's more of a uh, shopping list, if you see what I mean. I certainly didn't do it per the uh, minute or per the hour if it wasn't related to a uh, ground communication pass. And uh, I just made a point of, um, in fact, my agreement with the uh, Americans in, in uh, the soup in the Russian control center was they would just give me a, an English version of the Russian timeline, but without time. And they would just say, we want these experiments done today, these activities finished, do them when you can. And that was certainly flexible enough for me. Um, and uh, we, I think, executed that pretty well. Uh, I, I agree. I think you need some flexibility when you're in this sort of environment, trying to work all the time to... Um, to a rather artificial schedule seems to me uh, fairly pointless, and, he, and he, I think you, you lose interest in it as a crew member. Of course, uh, one thing I think you, I don't know if you have this, but uh, it's a question. Are you tied to specific um, AOS, LOS times with a control team or not? Uh, Mike, no. In fact, uh, we have no AOS or LOS uh, periods. In fact, uh, 
the 80, uh, 84, or maybe the 81 crew had suggested maybe we should have some, some blackout periods with the crew on the inside. We did not instigate that for, uh, particularly in our case, for safety reasons. Uh, but it is something certainly we'll be looking at when we go to uh, further out missions on the ground here, uh, such as Bioplex, which is our next, our next phase. Um, while I'm thinking about that, uh, I do have a question for Scott and Vladimir about the, uh, about the EVA. Um, I'm wondering how, uh, how you both found it out there. Uh, Vladimir, I'm sure, has not been in the, in the EMU on orbit before, but, and uh, Scott, I'm wondering how you two uh, got on together out there, and it must have been very beautiful looking up at Mir. Well, it was just spectacular. It was, uh, like I said uh, during the EVA, uh, one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen before, and uh, uh, it's sort of the buzzword for the crew, but uh, it was unbelievable, and uh, it truly was. And uh, uh, we had some uh, surprises during the EVA. Uh, for one, uh, my safety tether froze up, so I had to use an alternate tethering technique, which uh, was fairly uh, hand fatiguing, but uh, there was a pretty steep learning curve, and we were able to get the job done nonetheless. But uh, I'll have memories of uh, the spacewalk forever, in, in particular uh, one pass over uh, the Andes that uh, was cloud-free, and we could just see forever and ever the, the entire curvature of the Earth. And uh, um, I just looked over at uh, Volodya, and uh, he had a, a grin from ear to ear. It was uh, one of the the happiest uh, smiles I've ever seen in my life, and uh, so that's a that's a memory that I'll always uh, cherish from this flight. Um, I guess I'll pass it to you to talk about the differences between the suits. Uh, uh, hello. Both suits, the Russian and American suits, uh, allow to us uh, to make every task uh, we have right now in space. And uh, yes, we have some differences between two suits, but uh, it's not big, big difference because uh, both suits uh, was created for spacewalk. And um, I expect a uh, <coughs> new space suit, new joint space suit, where we take uh, best uh, devices from both suits and create it new for International Space Station. One last question for you guys up there, I guess, in terms of wrapping up. Uh, with missions on Mir of four months or greater um, from the U.S. point of view and uh, stays on station scheduled to be in the same time frame, how do you think we'll, uh, we're going to cope with missions uh, to Mars, for example, of up to uh, two years in length? Well, uh, that's a really good question, John, and um, I've talked a lot about that with um, the cosmonauts. And the big difference about being in space about the Earth um, on Station Mir or the International Space Station is that you have that beautiful view. Um, and the thing is, is if you're on a trip to Mars, I'm assuming you're talking about those long versions where you take about a, six months to go there and about a year on the surface, then a, six months back. The journey there and the journey back is going to be where all the problem is. And um, you just have bright, see the sun coming in right now, it's totally black other than the sun out there, if you look away from the Earth. And that's the way it will be going to Mars. Absolutely dull, quite quite dull and featureless during that trip. Very quickly the Earth would become small and, and Mars would not be visible. Uh, and very soon the Earth would not be visible because of the brightness of the sun. And uh, in those conditions, I think we'd be closer to what you're experiencing right now. You're going to have to find um, things to do that keep you busy the whole time. And even though I saw some fairly hard things um, on Mir, I was busy. I had things to do, and uh, the time went by uh, pleasantly and, and fast enough. The, um, one of the most favorite things I did, and I hope you have something like this, I have no idea what you have, was a greenhouse. And uh, all I had to do was go and write down temperatures and moisture for these plants, but I would grow, I grow three generations of seeds, and I uh, had to make observations very painstaking ones, and then get the data down and um, discuss that with the, the uh, investigators. But that experiment really kept me going in terms of my interest in the uh, in the space flight. And uh, I think not so much as making work for a crew that's going to Mars, but actually just finding activities that is are necessary on a ship like that, and making sure that there's crew involvement in a fairly habitual way will help them greatly. Well, Mike, we copy that. In fact, uh, we are growing lettuce in here and uh, relying on some wheat for some of our uh, air revitalization. 
But uh, as time's running short, uh, we, uh, we wish you folks Godspeed and farewell, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you on the ground in, in Houston fairly soon.